Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this special webinar on the year of the entrepreneurial lawyer. Um, it's, uh, I've been looking forward to this webinar for a long time. I've got with me uh, two very distinguished personalities who I'm very excited to talk to today. Um, my name is Nigam. Uh, I'm the Dean of the BML Bunjal Law School, and I'm the moderator for this webinar. I have with me here, Mr. Ritwik Lukos and Ms. Rupa Gosain, uh, two uh, personalities who will take us through the landscape of education and law respectively. Um, the reason I am delighted uh, to be in this company is because uh, we are trying to probe uh, by using various perspectives, the future career options that our students have uh, in a world where uh, technology, um, and innovation, and entrepreneurship is really changing the very landscape of our profession and of our careers. Uh, so it's in this context that we have started this webinar series, uh, and the law school is just one part of it. And what we're trying to do here is we are trying to uh, seek various perspectives from personalities who have already made a mark in their respective fields and see what their advice is to our aspiring students um, and, uh, and their parents, of course. So uh, what I'll do is this is going to be a free-flowing conversation. Um, I'll be asking them questions um, during this uh, by turn. And uh, through their answers, I want to weave a story uh, of what it means to be an entrepreneurial lawyer and what it means for students who are aspiring to enter into the legal profession today. So um, uh, Ritwik uh, is uh, a famous uh, lawyer and entrepreneur. Uh, he has uh, had made his mark in uh, legal practice and legal consulting, and also in recruiting um, high quality uh, lawyers for a variety of domains. Uh, Ms. Uh, Rupa Gosain is a accomplished educationalist, has got her experience in domain in various areas substantively, as well as uh, internationally and domestically in terms of geography. Um, she's the principal of uh, the Gems Education School in Karnal. Uh, I'll start by asking Ritwik um, a question about uh, your journey, Ritwik, a little bit as a, uh, as a lawyer and, uh, and also as a person who has in some ways chartered uh, new paths uh, in legal practice and entrepreneurship. And then I'll do something similar when I come to uh, Ms. Kosan as well. Ritwik, over to you. Thank you, Professor Nigam. Uh, you know, just thank you to the Bhimal Munjal University for setting up this conversation and for, for inviting me. Uh, I, I'll actually start uh, with kind of some childhood stories. Uh, I was kind of always looking for ways to supplement my pocket money. So even as a kid, I'd find ways of, you know, putting on a show, selling tickets, my dad would come back from trips, you know, mix shampoo and like try and sell it, you know, when someone's waiting for an auto. So that bit was there kind of early on as a kid. And I think I lost it, um, I think through the regiment of school, you know, and, and college, right? Uh, and I think the great thing is, uh, especially when I got to NLS, and I was, for me, getting to NLS was actually more important than actually studying law. I wanted that the environment of, you know, uh, being among that group of people and uh, the terrible water that we have in, in Nagar Bhavi. Uh, but it was really, I think, the, the great thing with law school was that um, so much of the law school life was up to the students to create. You know, we kind of, uh, hostels, as you know, Professor Nigam kind of, you know, was run by pretty much, you know, by the students, the mess, the committees, we would raise money. Recruitment, I think, famously, you know, the uh, you know the the institution was against kind of campus recruitment, and you know the early batches paved the way, and so the you know there was a lot of space to really kind of take responsibility, uh, and that is really kind of what what stayed with me, and really, uh, I think if we look at kind of a lot of our our friends and network within not just NLS, but others as well. I think this is one, one hallmark because ultimately to me, entrepreneurship is about taking responsibility and 
to create your own little world, right? To create your impact on the world. That's that's where it kind of comes down to. Um, post law school, I, I I was at Amar Chand uh, Bombay for a few years. Uh, did corporate law, structured finance. Very very busy time. Loved it. Worked with great people. But I, for me personally, I realized that that's not. the kind of success that i that i wanted for myself right i didn't want to be a partner in a in a large firm and i was uh, very fortunate to reconnect with uh, again old friends from law school where we set up uh, kind of the first venture that i was part of called rainmaker and then subsequently in uh, 2011 we set up bahura and then now counselect which uh, which i co-lead as well right thank you um, rithik for that uh, uh, introduction and i uh, i'll pick up on that thread a little bit later so you made some very intriguing statements as you usually do um, and about uh, entrepreneurship being um, something akin to taking responsibility i've actually not seen those two connections being made um, earlier so it's a very very interesting connection you made and i'll let let's pick up on that a, a bit later um uh, can i invite uh, ms rupa gosain to talk a little bit about herself her her uh, uh, journey as an educationalist and uh, her view of where students are today we are in very strange times as we can see all of us um but uh, it's also i suppose an exciting and a challenging time for students in today's world so over to you ms rupa yeah thank you uh, dr digam uh, for inviting me here for this wonderful uh, discussion Uh, yes, as a journey as an educationist has been very, very exciting and edifying uh, through uh, nearly more than two decades now, and it's been across cultures and across age groups and the length and breadth of India and abroad. And uh, one thing I've understood that students and children are the same across cultures, no matter what the time span, they remain the same. And as educationists, we have a great responsibility. in giving them the right platform so they become integrated individuals in the society and take it forward take it forward is the most important underlying uh, thing that i want to stress on uh, regarding careers i feel uh, now uh, things are changing there's a huge uh, shift in perspectives and the way society has evolved and changed even even in our schools now it is more than uh, more now a student centric a child based education which everybody is looking at and doing uh, with that comes the uh, you know inside the child comes the i the i is being celebrated in every child and with that what happens is the child is able to make choices and with the choices come more options and with more options the child is able to uh, you know now is looking at what works for him or her and in what is he or she in sync with like rithvik uh, rightly pointed out like you know he didn't want a career in a corporate because he was thinking in with what works for him and i think that is what is happening in every school now if, uh, in every child uh, the thinking of what they want to do uh, so that uh, leads us not to the uh, you know the typical careers that are, that had been there in the previous generation this z generation this particular generation is looking for what works for them and the second change that has happened in society is uh, the shift from security to uh, risk taking this is another mind uh, mind shift uh, that has happened so students now no longer want a job which is kind of you know makes them very secure uh, but they want to you know experiment and explore uh, what works for them so with that i think the careers that we are going to have in the future are going to be more uh, you know there maybe one individual have three or four careers and you can start over maybe like a doctor or a lawyer like it's big date and maybe branch out to be something like a life coach or a, a voice uh, a artist or uh, maybe a what a political campaign manager god knows and there are so many of these fields available now and with the advent of technology and the push with technology i'm sure uh, the, a lot of job opportunities are there so there is no one typical career that was there in the indian mindset now things are changing um i think that's um, um an excellent input for the session uh, uh, ms gosain i think it's imp- it's important to realize how uh, not just the substantive ecosystem but the uh, uh the mindsets of the students have changed uh, because of uh, uh, the way uh, they are being taught uh, and the way their aspirations um, and 
their uh, ambitions are being shaped uh, at, in the school itself, uh, through the curriculum, through the kind of choices they've got, et cetera. And that actually brings me to uh, an interesting inflection point, so to speak, uh, because then maybe we should connect that, the idea that students are now at a stage in their lives when they're more open to risk and more open to various options, much unlike what it was when in our, uh, in our times when we were in school. But what does that mean, Ritwik? I should ask you that, because you said um, uh, that there is uh, uh, entrepreneurship in the air, but that means a lot of responsibility. Uh, so uh, this session, as we know, is about um, entrepreneurial lawyers, uh, and of course, some connection with that to the kind of disruption that technology has brought in. So I want to kind of slowly take you through those uh, various um, elements of the session that I think are quite important that you alluded to in your introductory uh, talk here. So let's start with this, this idea of entrepreneurship and, and what, how, did you, uh, get, how did you kind of get into this, uh, this idea here and, and this way of doing things and what do you understand by it? You gave us some very intriguing hints uh, when you first spoke, so I wanted to kind of take that forward and tell us uh, more about it. So uh, I think there are some there are some phrases kind of that that capture that the spirit of entrepreneurship. For example, one common one that's used is to take something from zero to one, right? So to be able to create something virtually out of nothing, where nothing exists, but to create to create something. So entrepreneurship is fundamentally a it's a creative uh, step. Second, like I mentioned, it's about taking responsibility uh, through that creation process to so really shape uh, whether it's a product, whether it's a service, whether it's an organization, uh, whether it's a culture, you're, you're shaping all of that. And today, uh, as we know, you know, we're doing this call on, on Zoom, we're sitting in different parts of the country. Every, every activity is is touched by technology virtually. And every, uh, especially every business activity, every company today is a software company in some way, right? So, uh, so I kind of, I'd put those three things together just as an overarching uh, space. And just, you know, since I have uh, you, Professor Nigam and, you know, Ms. Rupa on the call as, as educators, uh, one thing I'd just like to, to share is sometimes, you know, I think, What's really important is to create a space where entrepreneurship mindset can can kind of start to uh, take take root and start to kind of flower. Well, you know, because today, like when I visit, I visit a lot of law schools and you know, uh, speak to young folks as well. Most education institutions, kind of everything is so spoon fed and so like structured, right? Uh, those free spaces of where students can kind of take responsibility, you know, those spaces to create, those options to create, uh, I, I don't know if, if it's shrinking, but it should be expanding, right? And I think that's, that's a great role that educators can play in, in just in leaving some spaces open uh, for that to happen. So in the law school context, it would be, you know, not just kind of whether it's raising money for Ligala, but you know, we'd create something new, right? So we'd set up the endless debate. Uh, so something new happening all the time, right? Within, within, that, uh, within that campus. And even now, um, yeah, I'll just pause there. No, that's, um, that's excellent. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I think uh, uh, the spirit of entrepreneurship uh, needs to be inculcated and nurtured Throughout. Uh, we do that a little bit, by the way, at the university, at our university, we have a center for entrepreneurship and innovation and we have incubators, but that's the direct one, you're the direct link you're talking about. But I think you're talking, my sense was you're talking about some more indirect things, like you're talking about things like how uh, students are encouraged to do various things according to their creative inputs and uh, and in almost any activity they do. So it's not just, it doesn't have to be an incubator where they're doing it. They can incubate their ideas without there being an incubator. And I that's think that's what you were uh, referring to. And I think that that's uh, uh, an excellent, um, an excellent uh, point that you make, uh, Rithvik. And I think all educationists should be, should be aware of it. That actually brings me to my next question to um, uh, Ms. Rupa, which is that, 
um, you, you said that uh, students are doing a lot of activities um, in their uh, school, which kind of uh, nurtures their creative uh, tendencies. Um, but uh, can I uh, probe further into, uh, is there your view of how we can, uh, at the student level, at, you know, when they're in high school and senior high school, um, how do we ensure that they have some idea about the uh, impact of technology um, on, uh, on life and careers? Um, I think um, I know that you have very um, strong views about the fact that the, the, the world outside is becoming a digital world and, and, and students have to be prepared for it. So is there, uh, uh, what are your views on that, uh, Ms. Rupa? Are you, uh, technology is changing everything. How do we kind of meet that at the school level? Yeah, technology is uh, uh, now the way forward. I mean, as far as, for example, uh, <clears throat> thing like coding. Coding is not something, you know, that uh, digital literacy and financial literacy, I feel. These two things are like reading and writing for students today who have to thrive in this world today. So, uh, like, coding is something which all students must know across the board. It is not somebody only who wants to become a computer engineer or a programmer, but he must know the basics of coding. What happens with that is that he learns to think creatively, think, learns to think critically, and he learns to manage uh, resources well and uh, learns to uh, you know, work in collaboration. So with that, what happens, a different kind of a mindset is generated. So coding is something which we are also encouraging in our schools. We have it across, uh, you know, digital literacy from grade one onwards and uh, children are doing that. So even making a, you know, a normal, uh, maybe if you make a Mother's Day card or an interactive card, that can be a platform for other things as well. And since all uh, walks of life now are, are not only touched by, but they're driven by technology, so having this literacy and this uh, thing is very, very important. So in our schools, we do have digital literacy at all levels. We have separate innovation classes where the students actually look at different concepts and see what comes out of that, whether it is scientific or mathematical or even English, for example, a launch of a broadcast channel. That itself is, you know, uh, something which is new, which has just happened in our school recently. So we are giving those kind of spaces to them. And uh, another innovative uh, thought we are, which we are going to be projecting soon, is having a tab and let the child learn. What is the skill the child needs today? The child needs, does not need a teacher to come and, you know, give all the quote unquote gyan to the child. The child needs to have, Google is there, everything is there. They need to read up, be able to make a kind of a flow chart there and process that information and present it in discussion and have questions emanating from there. This kind of an education is what is needed in all schools where children start to think on their own. And you know, with this new education policy, which, is, uh, which uh, has critical thinking, creative thinking as a way of life is what needs to be honed. So you give these kind of spaces to the students as Ritwik rightly pointed out, and let them explore where they kind of, uh, you know, uh, they burge in and they, uh, they uh, find their own individual uh, voice. If, if I could... Uh, yes, yes, Ritwik, yeah. sure. Uh, my son is five years old. Um, and, uh, you know, on, the, on this coding aspect, you know, fully, fully agree with uh, what, what Rupamam has said. So, for example, the coding is not just about kind of programming a language, but it's about uh, it's about a way of thinking. It's a way of logical thinking. So, for example, he has a game that uh, he loves called Code Spark. It's actually a, a way of teaching how to think like a coder, where using blocks and you can learn how to make functions and make characters move. But through that, you learn about uh, loops and using certain kinds of functions. So the, the way of thinking is more important than what syntax you use. Uh, you know, so I think that, yeah. Yeah, I think I, I, that's, that's exactly um, what we're trying to get at, I think, in this session, is that uh, those are the kind of skills that uh, we need our students and our future uh, engineers, doctors, lawyers, 
to develop, and that's what's important. So I, I'm glad that's been brought out here. Um, and uh, to, to, to pick up on that further, uh, Ritwik, how do you uh, place what this discussion has been about entrepreneurship and technology? How do you place that in the context of the legal field? Uh, what has been your experience and where do you think this is going? Uh, some thoughts on that, please. So uh, I think one is uh, really every, every practitioner who sets up on their own, every person who's founding a law firm is an entrepreneur. Uh, and I think the, the kind of education that they're exposed to also, I think, impacts the kind of entrepreneur they become. Uh, so I think the legal, the legal education... Uh, for example, I think, you know, with, with BMU, uh, you have certain programs in place that will help enable someone to become a certain kind of entrepreneur. So, for example, um, at a, I think at a very basic level, let's say financial literacy, you know, being able to understand accounts, uh, understand finance, uh, being able to, as an entrepreneur, uh, you know, we always think of entrepreneurs as being these crazy risk takers, but actually entrepreneurs, the good entrepreneurs are very good at assessing risk and mitigating risk. So when they take a course of action, there's the greatest likelihood of it succeeding because they have done that risk assessment. And law practice is all about, you know, uh, assessing risk and, uh, you know, being able to help your clients mitigate legal risk, right? legal risk, reputational risk. Regulatory risk. So I think there are certain aspects in terms of legal education that tie in very well with entrepreneurship. So I'd say, uh, so one is risk assessment and risk mitigation. The other is uh, communication. Uh, you know, all about everything about law practice is about communicating, writing, speaking. But maybe the aspects of communication that can be addressed more, which Professor Nigam, you do so beautifully in, you know, uh, when you write to your students is storytelling, right? Where you're, where you're, where you're communicating at, at a meta level and not just at a, uh, at a granular level. Uh, and then I'd say it's really about, you know, I think disciplines like uh, project management, uh, understanding technology, using tools, whether it's something as simple as Excel or, you know, learning to use new and new technologies. Um, and the last is really kind of leadership and working with teams. Uh, you know, all of those, those kind of elements tie into both the practice of law because the, the role of an individual lawyer now has reduced and reduced and reduced. So today, most aspects of legal practice you will do in a team. Uh, and entrepreneurship is all about building great teams that can, that can take on uh, big goals. Um, so, so lots of parallels and they really kind of tie into each other. That's fascinating to hear, Ritwik, because th these are kind of the kind of qualities that I think um, are increasingly coming to the fore, uh, but uh, are not being exactly seen as entrepreneurship, right? So, so you said risk mitigation, communication, uh, leadership qualities, teamwork. Um, and, and these are qualities that I think are extremely important for uh, uh, any successful um, career. Uh, and I think uh, um, the emphasis on entrepreneurship and innovation has actually brought that out. Uh, so what I hear from you, Ritwik, by the way, and I just wanted to push you a little bit more on that, is that what, what I hear from you is that those are qualities that are now important in many of the legal domains that you are working with, right? That's, and, that's, and, and perhaps because of the kind of acceleration by technology and the technology has changed all landscapes, including the legal landscape, you're know, saying these qualities are more important now than ever in, in trying to manage or navigate these kind of legal uh, landscapes. That's, um, um, uh, I'll take this up a little bit more, but before I do that, I want to um, go back to uh, Ms. Rupa and ask her um, a similar question, which is um, that we've been talking about technology, careers, new skills, um, do you, uh, uh, coming, coming down in, into more specifics, do you see uh, an increased interest in your students in the fields of liberal arts and the law, um, or, or are they still 
focused on engineering and, and medicine? No, I think uh, there's been again a great mind shift. You see, three or four decades ago, uh, liberal arts was humanities, and if you took humanities, it was because you were given a kind of a step brotherly treatment, and you know that uh, maybe you were not very good in mathematics or science, and so you have fallen over to humanities. But I think things have changed tremendously, and we have a number of students who want to major in liberal arts because it kind of uh, and also this awareness. I think in the uh, there are people at large, uh, educated people about how the brain works. And again, it's stemming also from that, that I, that I'm celebrating the I, what works for me. So, you know, things like brain mapping, which uh, part of your brain is uh, more functional left or your left dominated or right dominated. So people are aware of these things and uh, uh, people are aware of these things. And they are going according to uh, that. So I do have a lot. And the liberal arts, some of the colleges that are, you know, uh, giving liberal arts, I think it's a very beautiful courses they are giving, where there is a complete uh, uh, connected, uh, connective, uh, connectivity between all the subjects. For example, philosophy, psychology, geography, English literature, all are under one, uh, you know, the, uh, the student is taught to see all the connectedness and then apply that knowledge. So to my mind, as I see it, uh, liberal arts and humanities is not very different from science the moment you start applying it. So it is kind of applied humanities now and which uh, makes it very uh, scientific in its temper. And with that, a lot of social change is possible. So a lot of people are now uh, children are feeling that they want to be part of the society or a fabric. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, you may ask somebody that what would you want to win? Nobody would say that I want to be the prime minister of the country or uh, I want to, you know, uh, be uh, I want to make a difference in the environment. But now these are the answers you would get. So liberal arts and humanities is uh, uh, is very popular. And I think it's rightly taking the society forward. No, absolutely. In fact, um, the very idea of liberal arts itself is changing in some ways. Yeah. So we are in the midst at the at the Munjal University. We are in the midst of trying to develop a liberal arts program, and what we are finding is that the breadth and depth of liberal arts itself has yeah. changed. Uh, the imagination of what liberal arts is has okay. changed, and especially in the light of the new education policy, we see a major confluence between. Uh, science, humanities, literature, performing arts, uh, and, and 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 what what I think India and the rest of the world is going into is we're trying to challenge that idea that things can be taught in silos and yes. that we can actually have a lot of really interesting, um, almost um, uh, incongruous domains in yes. side with each other, right? Yes. And and so um, uh, I take your point that uh, that I think in line with what's happening in terms of creativity and what you've been talking about, the, the I in a child. Uh, I think in line with that, what's happening is we are saying uh, you shouldn't be restricted to any one stream or the other, and that you can actually take a, a bunch of uh, different interesting subjects in different streams and still, and then they kind of put that together and that will actually add to your education. It won't, uh, it won't deviate from your education. It will be something and a value addition to what you're doing already. That's actually a very, uh, very interesting uh, thought. Uh, and that thought brings me to, um, to Rithwik, because I want to ask Rithwik, um, yes, we, we are interested in um, technology, entrepreneurship, innovation. Uh, but if you were, to, if I were to ask you what kind of qualities you envisage in um, uh, young lawyers today, uh, what, what would your answer be in the light of what you have been talking about so far? So uh, any thoughts on that, Rithwik? Uh, so I'd put that into two buckets. One is uh, someone who is looking to make a career in the law. Uh, and that itself has, you know, so many options, uh, both in terms of litigation, the corporate world, uh, academia, policy. I mean, the, the, the choices are, are really wide. I think there it, it comes down to, let's say, maybe, you know, uh, three or four things. One is it's, it's always great if you are geeky about the law, you know, in, in some way, right? You have an innate love for the subject or the jurisprudence of it. Uh, you know, I know the, the best lawyers that, you know, they even today, like at night, they'll be like reading, you know, some 
either a you know legal book or case law like and like they just they just love it right so i think that inherent geekiness is is always great to have second is uh the law is always going to, is always multi discipline right uh you know you you you'll find this uh, surname dubash uh, you know among among the pasi community and dubash is basically do basha someone who can speak two languages every lawyer has to be able to speak multiple languages right you have to be able to speak the language of society of humanities of technology of science like because whatever you do the law is always a is something that that kind of interacts with with each of these aspects so if you have a curiosity about or to ask yourself what are you most curious about and then to build your career on that side if you're not that curious about the commercial world and financials build it somewhere else build it in an area that you can then combine you can combine the law and you can combine you know that that area together um third is um uh, I, my dad when kind of he was talking to me about uh, a career in law uh, we went to meet kind of uh, a senior lawyer and he coming back he said you know he told me the law the law has no mistresses or something like that basically saying that if you become a lawyer you know it like it is going to take up your entire life okay like you know so he used some phrase like that so i think inherently the legal profession is a very hard working profession okay so uh, going on that path means that it takes a lot of commitment of time of energy and it's it's good to know that up front and lastly uh, the law is also very much about people you're always dealing with people right whether if you're speaking to a judge you know dealing if you're talking if you're working in a team your clients are people so it's all about uh interacting with people building relationships and building trust because at the end of the day a lawyer is a trusted advisor at the end of the day that's who you are um some very interesting points uh, uh rithvik and uh, actually some of these things uh, i've been talking a little bit about as well in my letters to law students um uh, and um uh, one thing i i always say is um that the, the law will push you um, to do things that you earlier may have thought you're not capable of doing so your reference to hard work and um, you know challenging tasks is absolutely 100% uh, right uh, the other point um, that you were saying is that it's about uh, people skills uh, that's an important aspect of any any uh, any lawyer and i think that's something that uh, a lawyer of us should really be aware of the idea that interpersonal skills are a very important of a uh, lawyer's portfolio uh, and i think uh, and it goes a long way in in someone's career and also and i'm going to quote you on that in the years to come which is that you need to be geeky about the law that's a way that's an excellent way of putting it uh, and i and i and i tell my students that uh, you know when, when they come and when i then we teach them torts and contracts in first year and i see their heads drop i tell them that uh, that listen the, what i'm trying to do here with you um and i tell my faculty as well is that we try to look at law as an enjoyable uh, uh, inquiry uh, something joyful something exciting don't look at it as a necessary evil that you need to be done with and you go back to your hostel rooms and sleep um, and um, um, and that's a very important point because you know otherwise uh, it's it's going to be tedium for the rest of your life right so it's important that you are uh, as a future lawyer and and as a person who's in the law um passionate about stuff that's going on um in my most recent letter to law students i said that you know i take i think it's 80 20% 20% of your life is going to be slightly aggravating tedious you know you have to everyone has to file the tax returns you can't do anything about that and nobody has said that tax that they're passionate about filing tax returns uh, so uh, that 20% of your life is going to be you know it's going to be full of all those kind of things but and so you got to accept that but um, you got to be excited about the 80% right you got to make sure that whatever you're doing uh, which your profession you're in um, your uh, uh, you you wake up thinking something i'll do something about it today you know, something new something exciting um, and i think uh, uh, and i think that's a point very well taken uh, rithvik and i will uh, as i said remember it and and quote it uh, in the years to come uh, 
Um, uh, now, coming back to uh, uh, to uh, Ms. Rupa, uh, uh, same same kind of question that I that I asked uh, Ritwik. I said we have been talking about technology innovation, entrepreneurship. Um, have you seen um, uh, among your students and also among your faculty members, among parents, uh, any kind of interest? not in the larger kind of things we're talking about, that, that of course uh, I can see that, but in things like the law or law related fields. Do people, do students talk about that? Do they, uh, do they at, at all engage with uh, sort of legal and law related issues? Do they think of the legal profession as something that they are, um, that, that's potentially exciting uh, to, to go to? Have you had any, uh, just, I just want to see a glimpse through you into what the students think about the legal profession. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so uh, coming back to the choices that the children make, you know, uh, you're still not, uh, it's not a very fluid structure. Still, we are getting to that fluid structure, like the international boards where a lot of subjects are interrelated. So here still, uh, I think uh, we are getting into, if you look at the CBSE pattern, we are still looking at, uh, you know, after grade 11, the choice starts and they start thinking about it. Uh, but yes, I would say a lot of students do want to join and uh, become lawyers and uh, judges, as they tell me that we want to become a judge in the high court and stuff like that. Uh, but I think what is really missing is a kind of a mentoring to these students, uh, uh, which we need to really make them aware that how uh, the, the, the profession of law has now undergone a change and how, uh, how other like entrepreneurship and IT driven uh, things need are a part and parcel of uh, the, the law. No longer is that, you know, McKinsey and McKinsey or, uh, you know, some other uh, very big firm. So they, everyone has changed their tactics. So it is not a, a, you know, God there and that if you join this firm, uh, you know, things will be fine. Uh, if people are wanting to experiment and do things on their own and how, um, you know, specialization in their own field, like I was reading up on law, uh, they talked about, uh, you know, document review manager or uh, consultant lawyer and, you know, uh, things like that. And there are so many other fields, everything has got a law attached to it. And how you can bring that innovative part of understanding how you can accelerate that uh, law process uh, is what I think, uh, if we teach our children that, I think that will excite them even further because otherwise law is again about, you know, the huge books and volumes and volumes which you have to study. But apart from there, there are, you know, like I was seeing, uh, reading somewhere, they said they have this verbal assistant who tells the uh, artificial intelligence that tells the lawyers that, okay, you can uh, negotiate this contract and you can renegotiate this particular contract. And this is the order of negotiation. So, you know, if you t show them a more integrated approach to law, I think that will be uh, that will spur them even further into uh, uh, choosing this career. Yeah. I think Ritwik is just the man for you for this. Yes. This, is, this is exactly what he does. <laughs> he does. If you, yes, I think if you just if you just uh, tell him at any point of time in the day or the night to talk about <laughs> AI and uh, and machine learning and law, he will he'll do it. So, uh, so Ritwik, I think I think we should uh, we should just ask you that a little bit. Um, how is uh, technology? I mean, I'll give us a few examples, just to, just one or two examples of how um, technology is changing legal practice. I think that that'll be great for our audience to hear and for our students to hear. So, yeah. Sure. Um, right now, uh, there's uh, ODR week happening. Agami is running the ODR week, which is online dispute resolution. And I think that's going to be one example that's that going to touch all of our lives, if not already touched. So online dispute resolution is, is essentially uh, using technology, using systems, uh, to be able to resolve disputes much faster, right? So it could be, let's say you have a dispute with on your credit card, you have a dispute, consumer uh, dispute, you know, e-commerce, something's happened, you know? So a, a lot of cases that were going to the courts, you know, these small matters are now being resolved much more efficiently and it's a great experience for the person involved. For, for lawyers, uh, it's a and for especially legal entrepreneurs, it's it's a great opportunity to be able to create these platforms, right? So uh, you have young, uh, both young and kind of experienced 
entrepreneurs, both lawyers and technologists coming together to create these kind of ADR, ODR platforms. That's one, one example. The other is a lot of work is happening around applying AI and machine learning to the entire contracts domain. So contract automation, contracts analysis, uh, Rupa, ma'am, like you mentioned, kind of uh, assisting kind of negotiating positions, so even an ODR, uh, based on your profile as a user. So let's say as a banking customer, your data and behavior as a customer will inform the bank about what options they should give you. You know, are you a good, are you someone that they want to retain or are you someone that, you know, they don't want. So, you know, using data, using uh, technology will kind of then give negotiating positions. So it's combining technology, combining data, you know, in these areas. Uh, so there's a lot of exciting work happening, uh, especially in the legal entrepreneurship space, uh, using technology. Uh, the Agami website is one very good reference point, which is uh, agami.in. Uh, we're closely kind of involved with Agami. Uh, and uh, I think what we're seeing is also kind of, in a sense, law is almost becoming like engineering, where if you do law, it can set you up for many careers, both within the law and outside of it. So we have many lawyers who've joined these management consulting firms, folks who do an MBA and then get into business groups as well. Uh, there's a very good group called Lawyers Not Lawyering, uh, which has a lot of good uh, materials, uh, on this as well, uh, and resources on this. So yeah, it's it's exciting times, both within the profession and uh, offshoots from it. Thank, thank you, uh, Ritwik. We are actually coming um, to the end of our session. So let me take a few questions from the audience and um, have you people answer it. In fact, there's a question from the audience to me, so I'll answer that, and then I'll uh, and then I'll uh, um, I'll give the give the podium to you people. So how has BMU changed the teaching methodology in the pandemic is a question. And uh, the answer is that we obviously, like everybody else, we have gone online and uh, we use various online platforms, uh, a variety of online platforms, including Zoom, but not just Zoom, other platforms as well to um, uh, teach students. But that's just the beginning of it. I mean, in addition to that, we have to actually change the way we teach online completely. So we realized that um, student um, interest and student uh, passion in learning is more challenging in an online era. So what we have done, therefore, is that we have improved our feedback mechanism. Uh, we ensure that whatever we teach, we do a one-on-one -on -one session with each of our students um, in, in terms of learning, in terms of trying to make sure that they are following the um, the, uh, the subject properly. We are lucky in some way that we have a small group. Uh, our uh, law school uh, numbers allow us to do that, uh, to kind of pay attention to our students. We're still finding it challenging. I think online learning environments, there is fatigue. Um, after, uh, you know, we are now in our second year of online uh, teaching almost, and we know that there is fatigue among all our students and teachers. Uh, and, and that's a daily challenge that we face. Uh, but I think what we, what we try to do, therefore, is we try to make sure as much as possible that there is more feedback, more interaction, uh, more um, uh, back and forth between the teacher and the student, just to make sure that that happens a lot more than before. What was happening naturally as a result of being in the same physical space has to be created in some ways, an artificial way uh, in an online space. So that was my answer to uh, that question. Now I'm going to just go through some of the other questions here. One question was, which skills are required for me to become a good entrepreneurial lawyer? Uh, I think Ritwik answered that question uh, quite uh, in a detailed fashion uh, during, uh, during uh, one of the questions that we had given him. Is there anything you want to add to that at all, Ritwik? I know that you you said, look, we are looking for people uh, with good communication skills, good people skills, um, an ability to, to take uh, risk and responsibility. Uh, so uh, is there anything else you wanted to add to that? The question is, which skills are required for me to become a good entrepreneurial lawyer? Yeah, and I think we went, we went through those skills, but it, I think it, it all, the biggest uh, skill is really 
uh, what Rupa Ma'am also was talking about, which is the learnability. You know, just having that agile mindset to be able to learn new things and to be able to adapt uh, really well. Um, yeah, I'd say that's that's really the key. And the other is kind of I think the mindset of not accepting the uh, the so-called boundaries that are given to you, uh, you know, like not staying in your lane, right? So to kind of look outside and say, listen, how can I reshape this to to get to where I want to go? Or, uh, so I think just fundamentally, kind of I think just building that muscle. Um, Very interesting, actually. Ritwik, I'm going to be in touch with you much after this session. You know, taking up on all these kind of intriguing statements that you have made. I made a list already here with me. So, um, so you you have uh, many months of uh, repeated questioning from me the years to come. Ms. Rupa, um, one one interesting question for you, which I don't, I, I, which I, I find, um, I mean, I, I have thought about it as well, and, I, and I'm thinking, I don't know if there's an answer to it, but. Um, I, I, I would love for you to take a shot at it. Um, the question here is uh, from a student, uh, presumably. The question is, well, you've been talking about all these qualities, but um, how do I identify that I have these qualities uh, and therefore I can become you know, a, a lawyer at the end of it? Is there, is there an answer to that? Uh, are you speaking specifically about uh, being a lawyer, or are we generally talking about all the communication and leadership and everything? Yeah, I think I think this student was talking about it in general. So the question is, how can I identif identify that I have the required qualities? I don't know what he means by required. I, I pro probably he's looking at humanities and, and lawyers, but he's yeah. saying, how do I identify that I have the required qualities? Yeah. I think uh, here yeah, the schools uh, step in uh, lately. Uh, because they are the ones who are really going to for, you know, formulate and craft you into those kind of individuals. And the qualities that we have just discussed are, I think, across the board. They don't really uh, only for law. You have to be a good communicator. Uh, you can be in any field, even if whether you're a doctor or a scientist or a, um, or a shopkeeper or whatever. Uh, you require good communication skills. You require how to handle human, uh, human beings and human resources. And you require good management skills, you require good. So the point is that as you go through your education system, you uh, you integrate and engage in all the opportunities that come your way. That is one thing. I think just, uh, you know, taking on the opportunities headlong is something uh, which uh, should be a part of your personality. And the more you do it, the more you will discover yourself. So it's the idea is about discovering yourself as you go along. And there isn't any, you know, there are no these coaching centers are not going to make you leaders, uh, you know, uh, with all due respect and all of that. It is you as you engage into all the opportunities that come your way, you seek those opportunities. Uh, I mean, have no boundaries like Ritwik said and go ahead and, you know, just engage. Uh, I think that is what will bring out your personality as leaders, as communicators, as uh, innovators, as risk takers. Uh, and uh, you will learn, you will learn through failure and all of that will happen. But uh, at the end of it, I think uh, only good and, uh, you know, substance can come out of it. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. I, I think if anybody has any more questions, could you please either type it here or... Um, or, or let me know otherwise. Um, it, so I'll, um, I'll just end with one. Um, so I'll just end with asking uh, Ritwik one question. I think we have almost come to the, I think we're out of time. So just one, uh, I think you, you can have the last word, Ritwik. Um, so the question, Ritwik, is if, if, if I were to ask, if you were given an opportunity to talk directly to a student over old people like me, and saying, listen, you know, don't talk to the, the professor, let me talk directly to a, to a student, what would you tell him or her? Uh, about um, choosing a career or looking uh, looking at what to do when, when he or she leaves school? So I'd say uh, uh, two or three things. One, try and experience kind of different paths, even in small ways, like whether it's a small internship, uh, small project kind of exercise. Uh, there's nothing better than experience something for yourself. And that will give you a sense of, is it something you like, don't like? Having clarity on what you don't want to do is 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 a gift. Uh, it helps you eliminate choices. That's number one. Second is uh, there's a very useful technique called informational interviews, 
So if you're thinking about, let's say, becoming uh, a professor, speak to Professor Nigam and understand what it's been like to, to walk down that path in, in every way, kind of the frustrations, the good, the bad. Uh, what does it take to kind of reach the zenith of that, that path? Um, you know, so I, I'd say these two things. Rupa, ma'am? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, the one very interesting thing that we done during the online year. Uh, we had this something called a, a global uh, career awareness program, where I actually, uh, you know, got my old students who are already like somebody is an engineer in Google and somebody is an aeronautical engineer in the US or somebody. They came online and spoke to our students here and gave them the path, you know, and said that if you want to be, reach there, then how do you do that? And the children can identify with somebody who is just about six, seven years older to them, rather than somebody who is, you know, cross 40 and 50 like us. <laughs> so I think that's a very important experiential uh, uh, understanding which we can give our students in all uh, walks of life. Yeah. Right. Thank you. And the third thing I'd say is don't overstress it. Like Rupa Ma'am said, you will have multiple careers in your life. So your starting point doesn't need to be where you end up. Right. So it's OK. Like you don't have to, you know, put too much on that decision as long as everything else is in place. So it's, yeah. That's fantastic. Um, I'm, I've really enjoyed my time uh, with uh, both of you uh, today. Um, uh, I've got um, lots of insights that I actually normally would not have associated with entrepreneurship and, uh, and innovation. Thank you so much, both of you for coming here and, and talking to us. Um, and I'm sure our students uh, who uh, listened to the session would have found it uh, exciting and interesting. Uh, thank you once again. And, uh, and uh, thank you for the audience as well for, uh, for their questions and for listening to us. Good day to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.